So I'd like to go through the components of web accessibility. There are actually three separate components to web accessibility. The first of which is the content. So any of the information that you're um, putting up on the web on your website. Um, this includes um, your mobile apps as well. Um, it actually also extends to um, apps within mobile environments like iOS um, and Android. Um, and also rich uh, internet applications, so things like um, Google Documents um, as um, applications move into the cloud. The next component is actually the user component. So users will access information through web browsers or media players, or they may use some form of assistive technology. Um, for people who are blind and vision impaired, the two main assistive technology devices are screen magnifiers, which essentially blow up the screen to, so that all images are larger, um, or screen readers, which actually read out what's on the screen. Um, and just in a minute, I'll actually come out the front. Um, I know that an iPad is small, but I just wanted to demonstrate how Apple has actually made the iPad accessible to people who are blind. Um, I'm aware that people at the back might not be able to see very clearly, but come and, come and see me later if, um, um, if you would like a, another demonstration. And the last one are the developers. And really, although this diagram, um, which is actually brought, um, published by the Web Accessibility Initiative, and they're the guys within the W3C who produce all the standards, um, really it's developers, it's designers, it's uh, testers, um, it's multimedia producers, and it's also content managers that fit in within this um, component. Um, you as developers and designers are going to are using authoring tools like Joomla in order to create websites. But once you pass those websites on to customers, they're also going to be updating and maintaining the website. So what we're the approach that we're taking um, at Media Access Australia is a, a is a holistic approach to accessibility. Um, often at the moment, it's sort of almost lumped on developers to say you're the crux of of. I guess the process of where accessibility, accessibility needs to happen, but actually it needs to happen throughout the entire process. Um, it starts at user experience um, and usability uh, because there are going to be people who are going to try and access your website with a particular disability. Um, it goes through to design, so designers, um, one of the key things is colour contrast um, for those who are um, uh, vision impaired or have colour blindness. And then it does go through to the designers, but then also the content managers who are updating and, and changing content. And often that's where um, accessibility falls down. You might have commissioned a, a developer or you might be a developer yourself and you make this wonderful accessible website and you hand it over and within a week little cracks start to appear as people update information and you know, start to play with things. And, um, that's where a lot of the accessibility values come in. Um, there's also the evaluation tools, which I'll actually touch on a bit later. Okay. Now, how do I do this? <laughs> you might need to stand next to me and hold these. <laughs> right. Um. Right, so I've just turned on voiceover. Now, the nice thing about Apple is, is that their screen reader actually comes embedded with the technology. So whether you've got whether you're running um, Mac OS X, whether you've got an iPhone or an iPad, you're actually getting your assistive technology with it. And um, that's actually quite uncommon. Usually you have to buy assistive technology as an added extra, which of course is an additional cost for people with disabilities. So what's really interesting is Apple hasn't just developed a screen reader, they've actually made it work with a touch screen. So I've turned voiceover on now, which is their text to speech. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is that you actually use gestures in order to flick through the elements on the um, home page, I guess. So, so what it's just told me is, is that it's announced the name of the icon I'm on, calendar, and because I've got um, verbose mode on it, it tells me that I double tapped over. So it's 
So the gestures change slightly from what you were really used to, where you would just touch an item with a single tap, um, but it's actually telling you how you can access the, um, the information. So, how Double tap to open. No. Double tap to open. Double tap. Oops. Double contact. No. You can't do it with this, this um, orientation. So essentially, I've gone over all of the items on the page um, and it's really about to be. And it will just go through to the to the very end to iPod and then um, stop there and, and essentially give me a, a tone that will actually tell you that it's got to come in with the page. So I'm going to cheat. Sorry, welcome to Media Access Australia, Media Access Australia. <laughs> so, you do actually get used to listening to it, and let me tell you the amazing thing about this is kind of sort of about modern speech. If you listen to a native screen reader user, you will not be able to understand what they're listening to because they get so practiced at it that it's so fast that it's literally <laughs> and you. I can't understand it. I've got a few friends who are native screen reader users and just I can't hear it or And yet they are completely, you know, comfortable with that. But it's much like us um, learning to speed read. We learn to speed read, we learn to, you know, scan words very quickly. They're doing the same thing but with their technology. Now, this wasn't very limited, yeah, So I'm just using the Media Access Australia site as an example. Hopefully it will be friendly to me. Logic, link. Advanced search, link. Okay, so up the top right, we've got advanced search. Media access is very well known. Finish. Come out again. Heavy red sign. Okay. So um, I'm on um, any writer. TV, link. Education, link. So what it's telling me is it's announcing the items, but it's announcing that it's a link. So it means that I know that I can do something. Now, one of the principles of accessibility is to make link text meaningful. So, um, much like um, sighted people can scan through a web page, and often we, you know, we scan key areas, we scan headings to, to see what information is on the page, so that we might say, oh, well, the first two paragraphs aren't of interest to me, but the third thing, what's under there is. A natural screen reader will allow someone who is blind or vision impaired to actually skip through things. But if you haven't actually marked up your headings as H1, H2, and H3, and so on, they can't do that. Um, the same with the link text. Um, imagine skipping through all the links on a page, which this technology does allow you to do, and this is what you get. More, more, click here, click here. More information. You know, website, website. <laughs> so, so you can, you can see the problem. <laughs> so, so that's gone through all my items. It's actually told me that I've got to the end of the list. Move feature item bank, link. Form feature, move feature, teacher and two students and access to the library, finish. So unfortunately, for some reason, our teacher continues. Test, turn on captions to learn that you don't decided to, to speak in extra. Um, unfortunately, for some reason, the image is around the Australian logo of I think I'm touching it accidentally. Um, but what it's actually announcing there is when you can see it, it's got to read it. It's got to read it. It's got to read it. Normally, what we what you can see there um, is we've got a, a rotating feature, um, and we've got um, three. Uh, images, they essentially have the text um, and they have um, uh, an image. And on that image, they have, thank you, um, they have old text. Um, and that's another, um, I guess, one of the things that um, are quite important is, is to have alternative text on your images. Um, so that A, if someone can't see the image um, and there's important information there, you're actually conveying that important, important information. But the other reason might be this is they're in a regional area, the NBN hasn't come and they're on a really slow internet access and they just want to turn images off so that they can download things quicker. Um, as I said, accessibility is not necessarily just about people with disabilities. Uh, in the same way, often people with disabilities unfortunately aren't able to afford the, the best or the greatest of, of everything and, and this is what's called the digital divide. Um, and so again, they might want to be turning images off for, for other reasons as well. 
So that's just an example of some assistive technology. Um, anyone who runs a Windows machine and actually wants to play with a screen reader, you can actually download a free open source screen reader who's actually being developed here in Queensland by two blind developers. It's called NVDA, completely free, download it, have a play with it. Um, or if you've got an iPhone, um, just go into settings, um, general and accessibility, and you can turn voiceover on and have a play with that iPhone, iPad, iPod touch. I think the also big thing to remember though is, is that often screen readers are, and I actually stole this phrase off someone off the internet, are the poster child of accessibility. Um, accessibility is a lot, is actually a lot more than just screen readers. Um, as I mentioned, for people who are blind and vision impaired, they use screen magnifiers. For people in deaf and hearing impaired, it's often captions, but for developers it's remembering that an embedded media player must actually support captioned content. Um, for people who, with mobility impairments, they may not be able to use the mouse, they may only be able to use the keyboard. Um, in addition to that, they, they actually may use a head wand, essentially something that's strapped onto their head with a little um, wand coming out to actually be hitting the keyboard. Um, so there are a lot of different technologies out there um, and a lot of different ways people actually access um, computers. So I wanted to sort of give a little bit of a rundown of the guide, guidelines and technologies for accessibility. Um, so I've, laid, I've um, added some tags to the diagram. So for content, what we're mainly looking at is WCAG 2, and I mentioned WCAG 2, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines before. Um, for authoring tools, we're looking at ATAG, Authoring Tools Accessibility Guidelines. Um, ATAG is particularly good if you're actually um, either looking to choose an authoring tool, which as we're in the Joomla meetup is probably not what you're doing. <laughs> you're probably Joomla all the way. Um, but um, ATAG looks at um, accessibility two different ways. It looks at the um, tool itself and how well the tool is actually supporting accessibility for a developer with a disability but it also looks at how the tool is actually creating information that's accessible. So for instance, if you've got an, for argument's sake, um, a plugin that allows you to upload images, if that plugin doesn't allow you to add alternate text, then you've got a problem. Essentially, you need a new plugin or you need to hack your plugin. Um, so it's a, things like that. Um, the media, the web browsers, um, assistive technologies and that all come under UAG, the user, oh I've forgotten the second U, the user something <laughs> accessibility guidelines. Um, and finally there's a technology which I'll talk a little bit about um, soon called Way Aria, which is specifically for developing rich internet applications, so all the things that you commonly hear you can't do that and make it accessible. You can't have a, you know, a menu tree and make it accessible. You can't have a drag and drop and make it accessible. No, we can. About oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, so WCAG is actually based on four design principles. Um, they are that information is perceivable, i.e. you can actually perceive that information irrespective of how you're perceiving that. So um, text alternatives is a good example of that. Um, captions for what um, WCAG calls time-based media, which is essentially audio or, or video content. Um, the information is operable. Um, you can actually get at it uh, through, say, keyboard accessibility. Um, they give you enough time in order to um, complete a task. So timeouts are often the bane of people with disability where, you know, you've got two minutes to complete a form. Well, you can imagine that if you're using assistive technology, i.e. a head wand or something like that, it's going to take you a lot longer than the average person. You get to the end of the form, you hit submit, and it goes, sorry, you've timed out, you've got to start again. Not so fun. Um, that information is understandable, um, and a lot of these um, also cross over into that usability space. So um, the idea that information is predictable, you know, we sort of predict where menu items are going to be, um, and that kind of thing, that also comes into this. Um, and that information is robust, which essentially means it can be used with different technologies and different assistive um, devices as well. 
So WCAG itself is actually um, hierarchical. It is based on the four principles, as I've outlined, and within each principle there are a number of guidelines. So, for example, guideline 1.2 is that you provide alternatives for time-based media, which, as I said before, is your audio and video content. You then have success criteria, and success criteria are actually testable statements. So, in this case, success criteria 1.2.1 is that captions are provided for all pre-recorded audio content. This gets a bit confusing, but just bear with me. <laughs> Synchronised media, except when the media is a media alternative for texting is clearly made as such. I won't go into the intricacies of that. Essentially, it means um, provide captions for your video content. Um, and then there's techniques. So the techniques in order to satisfy criteria 1.2.1 are to provide open or always visible captions, so they're captions that are actually part of your video content, or to provide closed captions where the captions actually exist in a separate file and essentially using your um, media player you can turn them on or off. What's nice about WCAG is, and, and this was actually a change between WCAG 1 and WCAG 2, is, is that WCAG 2 is what they call technology agnostic. So until you get to the success criteria, at no stage is it talking about a particular technology. It's the techniques um, where they start to actually provide information about the particular technologies that you're using. So for instance, whether you're coding in HTML or Java, um, whether you're using a, one particular captioning format over another. My holy bible for WCAG is the Quick Reference Guide. So the Quick Reference Guide actually allows you to customise um, what you're, essentially what you're seeing when it comes to WCAG. So you can say, for example, just show me the level A criteria and you can say only show me um, techniques, for instance, to do with HTML and CSS because I don't want to know about server-side, client-side, Flash, or so on and so forth. It actually takes you through and it has all of the different, um, it, it's hierarchical, so it has the, um, the guideline, the success criteria, um, and then it has all of the techniques so it has what's called sufficient techniques, so if you want to satisfy this criteria, here are the sufficient techniques that you need to, to meet or to do in order to make this particular piece of content accessible. Um, but then it also has very nice examples of if you have done this, then your information is not accessible. Um, so essentially it takes all of the guidelines and also the techniques that have been written up by the, the Web Accessibility Initiative and makes them just a little bit more digestible and sort of brings them all together. So I would, it's really hard to talk about accessibility and say, this is what that shall do in order to make things accessible because it will all depend on the complexities of your website, um, what you include and what you don't include, um, how much, how much uh, you have done prior. So um, some people I think I've mentioned that, oh, you know, I'm a designer and I develop in Joomla. So you're essentially wearing two hats um, in the development process, whereas others might actually have the design handed over to them and they just purely have to focus on the development. Um, some developers may just be design, designing the actual template and the skeleton um, and the content in the, the content area is, is not going to be their responsibility. So it's quite hard to sort of draw hard and fast rules and to cover everything. But I thought I'd cut, go across 10 or however many I finish in my time left allocated. Um, tips for accessibility. So I mentioned alt tags on image. Um, using an ordered layer is essentially using your markup um, correctly. So things like headings, um, tables, making sure that you specify table headings within your tables, that kind of thing. Um, providing captions or transcripts for media and also for people who are blind or vision impaired, audio description. So imagine you're watching Jack the Ripper, and I actually haven't watched Jack the Ripper, but I'm sure there must be a scene in there where someone's coming up with a knife behind someone else, and you hear that scary music. How can 
have someone who's blind, they might be able to hear the dialogue, but they don't know what's happening in the scene. So audio description is actually describing the salient pieces of the video um, in audio. So it's essentially an audio overlay. Um, use descriptive links and text. Um, and use accessible text. Um, someone who is maybe just getting a bit older and, and finding it a little bit hard to read the text may simply want to increase the text size using your web browser. Um, so ensure that your, your text is actually can be resized using the browser. Um, check your colour contrast. I won't go into specifics about that. And don't use colour only as the visual cue, you know. Uh, required fields are in red. Mm, sorry, I can't see red because I'm colourblind. Um, allow users to skip over navigation. So um, one of the ways you can do this is to have some hidden links that um, allow you to, say, skip to menu, skip to main content. Um, and if I get to way out, I always go over time in presentations. There's other ways to do that as well. Um, I'm going to skip number nine and go straight to ten. Captures are accessible. A, if you don't have to use captures, don't. B, if you can find a way around captures, do. How many times as a sighted user I have to keep re pressing refresh on a capture in order to get something that is legible? The alternative to capture, captures for people who are blind and vision impaired is an audio capture. But what essentially happens is, is that there's a whole lot of crackly noise behind it and then they read the letters um, as part of that, that track. It's equally as hard to hear when it's an accessible version and this is, is for us to see. So please, find another way if you can. So I wanted to touch on way area. How much time have I got? <laughs> yeah, you've got some time. I've got some time? Yeah, you've got some time. Ah, that's good. Sorry? It depends on the pizza turns up. Ah, the pizza turns up. well, okay, it's me or the pizza. I know who's going to win the pizza. <laughs> um, Way Aria is um, a technology also developed um, by the W3C and it was developed um, because it was very clear that um, scripted or dynamic content was often inaccessible to people with disabilities. Um, so things like JavaScript and Ajax that allow you, as I said, to do all those nice funky things often resulted in an inaccessible website. And so Way Aria was born, Aria standing for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. So there's a few areas that I want to go to, to go over in Way Aria. The first is our landmark roles. So essentially, a landmark role allows you to say this piece of content on a website plays a particular role. Um, so there are some obvious ones. Um, often, you know, you'll have the, your logo um, up the top, which is part of a banner. Um, you might have your main navigation down the left hand side, um, and then the main content area. As you can see, you can actually assign role attributes and give them a, um, um, a name, uh, which is specified within the, um, the um, ARIA specification. So um, this particular area is a banner, this is a navigation, this is main content. So I mentioned before that assistive technology will, for instance, allow you to skip through headings. Well, assistive technology and screen readers that um, support um, ARIA, and a lot of them do, um, will actually allow the user to cycle through the ARIA landmarks so they can go straight to the navigation or straight to main content. So if they become familiar with the site, you can, they can just actually jump straight there. Mm -hmm. With the uh, landmarks, do you, is that still applied with HTML5? Yeah, um, HTML5, some of the semantic information in HTML5 will um, sort of supersede what ARIA is doing. ARIA actually came before HTML5, and of course HTML5 is probably two years away from being a, stand, you know, a, a stable standard. Um, also at the moment, a lot of the browsers don't actually support um, those particular um, roles. Um, and more importantly, most of the, um, I can guarantee most of the assistive technologies aren't actually supporting the HTML5 semantic markup. So at the moment, my advice would be to stick to WayARIA, or if you are using HTML5, to also include the ARIA landmark roles, because at the moment we're sort of, as the, the landscape shifts, it's really hard to sort of cater for everyone. On the same topic. 
if we do that and we do HTML5 with the roles in it, mm -hmm. that's get your point eight, which is the speech navigation stuff. Uh, yes and no. Um, again, it depends on how old the assistive technology is that people are using. Um, so a lot, of, particularly for people who are um, using commercial screen readers like JAWS, they're in excess of about $1,500 and an upgrade is not free. You actually have to pay for the upgrade. So we do find that there's a lot of people who are using older versions of screen readers and who may not necessarily also be supporting ARIA. Um, so my advice there is to still keep the skip links right now, but also include the ARIA for those who actually have the assistive technology to support it. Um, interestingly, Google is actually already using ARIA roles. So, ooh, my search has gone a bit big, but that's okay. So you can see here it's actually marking up their um, search form with a role equals search. Um, they've marked up their left-hand navigation with a role equals navigation. Um, the main content area where the results are are main, and also the um, information down the bottom is marked as content info. Um, another area that's, or another thing that way ARIA focuses on is live regions. So these are regions that actually update. Um, for example, the Australian um, uh, mental block, Australian tennis, what's it called? The Australian Open. <laughs> um, the Australian Open, you know, when you go onto their website, you can actually get a live update of the scores. Um, now, as sighted users, we can generally see when a score updates, but often that update is not communicated to assistive technology. So someone can be sitting there with their assistive technology and they don't know that something has changed on the web page, such as a, a sports score or any other um, region that, that is actually live updating. So what ARIA allows you to do is it allows you to define that region as a live region and then it gives you, which I love, a polite list level. <laughs> so you can either say that your, um, your live region, you can say, turn off all notifications, essentially, um, it won't inform the screen reader that, that anything has happened. Um, you can be polite about it, so if they're just sort of important updates, um, it will generally be polite about how it informs the user, so it may actually allow them to get to the end of what they're reading and then play a sound which says there has been something that's changed on the web page. You can be assertive about it, so if it's a high priority, you um, can assign an assertive role, or if it's critical, you can be really rude about it and essentially it will stop everything that the screen reader is doing and just interrupt you and, and, and essentially give information about what has changed. So I love the way they're going into politeness level. <laughs> um, funnily enough, I took out the, the, um, um, the slide that um, the I am client buddy actually uses the live regions because as you can imagine, as, as um, uh, as messages come through, that's actually quite important. You know, if you're chatting with someone, you need to know when a, a new message comes through, or when, when someone um, IMs you for the first time, and you know, pops up a new tab um, with you know flashing one. Well, that's not really going to help the assistive technology user. So it actually uses live regions to alert them when there are changes in states. Um, and the last one is actually assigning roles and states for widgets. So these are all, the, as I said, the funky things you can do, like you know, sliders and mini trees and dragging and dropping and, and all sorts of things. This is just a, a simple example of a, a slider where you can um, actually assign, um, in this case it's a button, something, a role, which is slider. Um, you can set a minimum value, which is terrible, a maximum value, which is excellent, and a value now, which is good. Um, and so that actually will um, allow the user to actually access the slider and use the keyboard to, to actually change the, um, uh, the value of the, the particular slider that you're using. So just a quick word on evaluation. And I thought it was great how that, I was, as I was listening Frank, to Frankie, as you said, there were so many things that I thought, this is not just usability, this is accessibility and usability together. And essentially it's because anyone who you consider, you know, your audience may have a particular disability, they're all users, you know, they're, they're just another person out there, they just may have different needs from the people you would normally identify as, as your key users. 
So when you're actually evaluating um, accessibility, it's a combination of automated evaluation, manual evaluation, and user um, testing. Um, within the um, WCA guidelines, there are a number of guidelines that you can check using an automated tool. However, at least probably 50% does involve manual testing. So for instance, a um, automated tester can check if you've got alt text on an image, but what it can't check is whether that alt text is actually meaningful. So you'll find some sites, and, and I would imagine, although Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, um, would just assign, say, a random alt text um, for an image, like name. Um, an accessibility check will go, yep, yeah, you're great, you've added alt text. A user, though, going through your website who hears name, name, name for every image is not going to be so happy with it. So it, it, it does involve a um, combination of automated and manual testing. Most of the um, accessibility checkers, though, will actually um, give you, will actually look at all of the um, elements that it can test manually and um, give you feedback on those, but then it will also flag all of the elements that, uh, Sorry, did I get that wrong? I think I did. It will look at all the elements that can be tested automatically and report on those, but it will also flag those that you need to manually test. So it says, you know, for instance, you've got, you've got an alt text here, um, check that that is semantically meaningful or meaningful for the user. Um, so it will actually guide you through that. Um, but most importantly, you can't overlook user testing. Um, WCAG is a set of guidelines, and you can go out on the web and you can read a whole lot of blog posts about, you know, is WCAG good, is it bad? Um, essentially, it is a checklist, it will get you close to accessibility, but it does not replace user testing. Much like you can follow, I would imagine, all the guidelines in the world for usability, but that doesn't replace user testing. Um, a good example, we actually developed a, um, a website for a project of ours called um, Cap That is actually uh, encouraging teachers to turn on captions in schools for both for both students who are deaf and hearing impaired but also for literacy and um, people where English is a second language. Um, and I did the accessibility testing or the first round at least on the, the website and we had a, a countdown on the top sort of X days until entries closed because there was a competition associated with it. And I looked at it and immediately could see that's not going to be accessible. Because essentially, the whole banner at the top was one image. Um, and so when I ran the screen reader over it, it went, you know, da, 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 12, 4. Um, no context around it, no nothing. So if what you saw on the screen was is you saw, um, you know, days till entries close, four days, um, five hours, for instance. But because that was all part and parcel of one single image, all the screen reader read was the actual numbers, which were, were text. Um, now, that's not something that your evaluation tools, either the automated or the manual ones, are going to, to pick up. That's something that I guess I, you know, working in the area, picked up with a, um, a screen reader, but it would be something, for instance, that a user tester may also pick up in the process as well. Um, I've listed a few free web evaluation tools. Um, a checker. They're, they're all online tools. Um, unfortunately, with most online tools, they do only check a single page at a time, which is a bit of a pain, but um, a checker is a very good one, and it does check with a two. Um, WorldSpace FireEyes is actually a Mozilla Firefox plugin. It works with um, Firebug. It is in beta, although it's pretty good from what I've um, used. It does actually allow you, although it won't crawl all of your website for accessibility, it does actually allow you to log an accessibility report for each page that you visit and then to sort of to go back and, and, and save that and, and essentially export it as a, a single um, evaluation document. Um, another really popular one made by WebAIM is WAVE. Um, it's actually not WCAG 2 compliant at the moment. They are working on that, it's WCAG 1. But it does have some nice features like it enables you to just 
Um, it will wipe out everything except for your heading levels, so you can see you know, what your heading levels are, whether they're marked up appropriately. It will also strip out all the CSS using another button and just show you the plain text format, which often can be very useful as well. Okay, I nearly finished. <laughs> Yay! I've got to hope. <laughs> Three things I wanted to, to just mention. Um, first is, is that Media Access Australia has actually been working with the University of South Australia and we're um, in a position right now to be running our inaugural professional certificate in web accessibility compliance. It's actually a six week um, online course, particularly for web professionals and particularly in the area of accessibility. Um, this is this inaugural course is by invitation only. Uh, what we're looking at is getting some really great feedback from um, the web professional community. So if anyone is interested, please see me after the presentation. I can give you a bit more information about that should you um, be interested. Um, the second one is the uh, Aussie Way conference. Um, Aussie Way is actually the only web accessibility conference, the only dedicated web accessibility conference in Australia. It's been running since 1998. It was actually um, set up by my supervisor who supervised me for my master's thesis. Um, and this year I've taken over the organisation of Aussie Way. Unfortunately, there's a new website. It's nearly there. It was supposed to be up by now. It's not quite. <laughs> but uh, it's only a few days away. I'll hang my head in shame. There's a Drupal site. I'm sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Drupal community seem to be pushing ahead a bit more on accessibility than the Joomla community, so don't hold it against me. But look, it's a fantastic conference. Um, it's no more than 100 people, so it has a really strong community focus. It has a strong practical focus. The people who come there are about sharing their knowledge, sharing about their experiences. It's not about grandstanding. It's not about the stuffy academic, you know. It's a really fantastic conference. This is going to be my ninth. I attended it first in 2002 and have every year since. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit biased. Peter went last year and he actually presented for me as well uh, on junior accessibility. So if you want a slightly less biased view, don't talk to him. Either way, there is an old website up. Don't hold that against me either. But there is a mailing list that you can subscribe to. And as I said, in just a couple of days, we'll have the new website up. The call for presentations are also out, so if you happen to be in accessibility or know someone, please feel free to point them towards the call for presentations or think about coming in and taking yourself. And lastly, what we're really excited about, which is on the horizon, is a project called Access IQ. What we've realised is, is that, particularly with the push by the Australian government to um, make their websites accessible, that there's a need for a repository of information that um, designers, developers, essentially web professionals and managers and decision makers can come to to find practical information about web accessibility. Um, my job is accessibility and I struggle to keep up with all the information that's out there um, and also to sort the wheat from the chaff. So what are people, you know, people are putting information out there, you know, is it actually correct information? And so we're embarking on a major project called Access IQ, um, and it's going to be a repository as a set of information, including uh, seminars and training, um, also an um, expert database as well, um, particularly for guys like you to actually come to access that information. So that's on the horizon. We've actually got a separate part of our website at the moment called Practical Web Accessibility, which we're starting to put content up which will be migrated over to Access IQ when it's ready. Um, visit our website, mediaaccess.com. Um, and um, yes, yeah, look for the, the practical web accessibility section. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, please feel free to contact us. As I mentioned, we're not consultants, but we definitely talk to people. <laughs> um, we're more than willing, if you want to ring us up, we can have a crash course in web accessibility. We can point you towards people who can help you. Um, with any, you know, understanding accessibility, accessibility audits, whatever it is. Um, we're pretty friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much. The pizza is walked in. We have to go. <laughs>